The year is 1983, and Don Decker from Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, was patiently serving time in prison as a result of bad company and even worse decisions. It wasn't an easy existence, but it could have been much worse. Don was determined to do things right, to get his life back together, and to move on without getting into any more trouble. Dave Keenhole, the prison ward at the time, described Don as a quiet and introverted young man, definitely not the type to start any trouble. But then again, isn't this exactly the kind of vulnerable soul that finds themselves victims to powerful and unexpected threats? For Don Decker, the terror started back in his childhood, at the cold and unforgiving hands of his grandfather, a cruel and abusive old man who tortured this innocent kid for as long as he had him within arm's reach. But in 1983, Don was saved from his grandfather's claws. He was locked away, but also protected by the thick walls of the prison. Except for the fact that his grandfather, all of a sudden, wasn't so limited by his physical body anymore. The infamous old man died while Don was in prison. It wasn't a tragedy, though. It was quite a complicated situation. But if one thing was certain for Don was that he felt relieved his grandfather couldn't hurt him any more. Or so he thought. Despite his less than fond feelings for his grandfather, Don was given the chance to leave prison for a weekend so he could attend the funeral. It was a strange experience. Not only did Don not want to be there, but the rest of his family also didn't want him to be there. In fact, he wasn't welcome in his mother's home. He would have to find somewhere else to stay for the weekend. Although not anyone would offer a hand to a convict, an old friend, Bob Kiefer, was kind enough to give Don a chance. He offered him his own home with his wife and children in it, a roof over his head, and warm meals, until he had to go back to prison. Don was grateful. And Bob? Bob had no idea what he had gotten himself into. That night, as the family got ready for dinner, they waited for Don, who had gone upstairs to wash his hands. They waited and waited, but the young man was taking too long. They wanted to give him his space, worried that he was upset about the loss of his grandfather. But too much time had passed. Bob started to worry there was something wrong with Don, but he couldn't have imagined how bad it could be. He sent his son to call for him. No one in that house had any idea of the particular kind of hell that had been unleashed in the small upstairs bathroom, just for Don Decker. Almost as soon as he was alone in that bathroom, Don became aware of a strange feeling. It was all around him, maybe inside him. It was impossible to describe. His heart started beating just a little faster and he started sweating a little more than usual. He didn't know what was happening, but he tried to push through. That was when he turned around to take the towel to dry his hands, and everything changed. He got dizzy, confused, and so cold. The temperature dropped unnaturally, instantly making him shiver. All at once, Don felt sick to his stomach. But none of these violent physical reactions could compare to what happened next. The face. Don looked ahead of him and found himself staring at the bathroom window, where a face was pressed against the glass and staring directly at him. It was the most horrible face Don had ever seen. It could have ripped a desperate scream out of him if he wasn't suddenly frozen, sick and scared out of his mind. The face was that of a really old man. His grin was heinous and obscene. 
His eyes were piercing Don like daggers. He was surrounded by absolute darkness, and although the glass separated him, Don felt as if that face was consuming him whole. It was far from the end of his torment. The room turned even colder, and Don could hardly breathe. The light started flickering until there was more darkness than light, until Don couldn't make out what invisible forces were tugging from one direction to the other, tossing him around the bathroom like a rag doll until he crumbled down on the shower floor. Immediately after, he finally screamed in pain. It was sudden and excruciating. He had no idea what had caused it, but he knew his arm felt on fire. He scrambled to roll up the sleeve of his shirt, and he found three thick and deep scratches on the inside of his wrist, bleeding profusely. Don understood that not only was he not alone in the bathroom, but whatever was there with him, it was evil, and it wanted to hurt him. Before Don could recover or search for answers, he heard somebody calling his name. The lights were back on, the cold had dissipated, and the horrifying face in the window was gone. Quickly, he washed his hands and the wound on his wrist. Then, he went down to join the family for dinner, hoping for the best. Bob, however, instantly noticed that his guest was upset. He looked sickly pale, sweaty and disturbed. As if that wasn't enough, shortly after they started eating, Don reached out for his glass and a strange sight caught Bob's eye. He reached forward and grabbed Don's hand, which he turned over gently, revealing the three red wounds on his skin. What did you do, Don? Bob asked him with a trembling voice. But all that Don could reply again and again was, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Don tried to explain that something or someone else had done that to him in the bathroom. Something with a face that looked like the devil himself. It was hard to believe, naturally, and the last thing Don needed was more attention. So the family managed to push past that tense moment, finish dinner, and retreat to the living room. However, the problem wasn't the bathroom itself. There were no safe corners in that house anymore. Nobody in there was safe anymore, and they would find out soon enough. It started with a terrible cold, something that invaded their bones without warning. It was exactly the same thing Don felt in the bathroom, but he kept that to himself. Something was different this time. Bob's wife spoke up. I think we have a problem, she said. But that was about to turn out to be a severe understatement. Bob and his wife moved to a wall of the living room, where they noticed water running down. It was the strangest thing. In fact, it should have been impossible. There were no water lines at all in that part of the house. But it was even more unsettling when they realised it wasn't exactly water at all. After a fleeting touch, Bob confirmed it had a sticky texture. Something strange. Definitely not water. And it definitely wasn't over. A strange noise announced the next chapter of the nightmare. Then, a drop. And another. And another. In a matter of seconds, water drops were falling out of nowhere, leaking from the ceiling, raining down on the living room. Now that couldn't be a regular leak. It was pouring rain indoors, and it wasn't even regular water. The family started freaking out. They didn't feel safe, and they knew they weren't. 
The rain didn't stop, and the eerie feeling increased. Bob and his wife frantically searched for answers, but Don Decker, Don, was completely detached from his surroundings. He barely reacted to the rain. He just accepted the mysterious waters falling upon him, as he sat stiff and expressionless on the couch. Bob couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't figure it out alone. So he reached for the phone and called his landlord, Ron, who asked why it was so important that he come over at that moment. Bob couldn't give him a reasonable explanation. He insisted the man had to see it for himself. A few minutes later, Ron showed up at the Kiefer's house with his wife, Romaine. They were skeptical but concerned about Bob's situation. But when they finally entered the living room, their minds were blown. Nothing could have prepared them for what they saw. It couldn't just be a leak. It hadn't rained in town in days. And it was the strangest thing any of them had ever seen. The two men headed upstairs to search for answers. But if anything, they only found more questions. The upper floor was even more eerie than the living room. It was unusually quiet. The lights flickered like never before. And there was a new draft that made them shiver against their will. They searched the bathroom carefully and found absolutely nothing. Not until they heard all the doors of the upper floor slam shut, one by one, without reason or explanation. Their hearts skipped a beat. They realized they had never been so afraid. Ron was convinced, all at once, they were dealing with something evil, some kind of spirit that had invaded that house. He couldn't see it, but he could feel it. When the group reunited in the living room again, they were still up for more terrible surprises. Don was still barely conscious, looking lifeless on the couch, thinking about nothing but his grandfather, still looking for ways to hurt him. And then, Bob and Ron realized that at the same time, there was water coming up from the floor, not falling down, but completely defying gravity by sending drops of water from the floor up to the ceiling. It was way too much for them to handle. They needed more help. Bob took the initiative of calling the police, and he was lucky that a kind officer who personally knew and trusted him picked up the phone, believed in how upset he sounded, and made his way to the house. However, Officer John Boyan got much more than he bargained for. Within seconds of entering that house, the police officer was attacked by the exact same feeling of freezing cold that embraced everyone else in there. And that was barely the beginning. John Boyan did everything he could. He swore he tried his best to find something to do, a way to help that desperate family but he came up empty-handed. This defied anything and everything he had ever seen and believed in. In the living room of that house, he watched water pour from the ceiling, levitate from the floor, and even cross the space in a perfect horizontal line from the living room, through the dining room, toward the darkened kitchen, like a deadly bullet. There was nothing he could do but wish them luck on his way out. The group still inside the house had no option but to take matters into their own hands. The women took the lead. Bob's wife knew there was something wrong, but she was sure it wasn't the house. Nothing like this had ever happened to her family before. There was only one possible explanation, and he was sitting on the couch, without reacting to the chaos around him. The two women grabbed Don Decker and led him toward the kitchen, where they interrogated him. Don, what are you doing? Don, whatever this is, you have to stop it. Are you listening to us, Don? 
Say something, please. Don, you're scaring us. There are children here. Why are you doing this, Don? Why? Stop it, Don. You have to stop this immediately. It went on and on. They grew frantic, desperate. They tried raising their voices. The tension in the kitchen was unbearable. It finally reached a boiling point. Then, all hell broke loose. All at once, a thundering noise filled the room. All the pots and pans and dishes in the kitchen started violently rattling. It was the effect of a severe earthquake, except the ground wasn't shaking in the slightest. The kitchen utensils and the cabinets knocked against each other, making a huge mess. Everyone freaked out, covering their ears and reaching for each other. Except for Don Decker. Don continued to act as if he was in a trance, completely oblivious to everything around him, until he was seized by these malevolent forces too. The helpless witnesses could only gasp and scream as they watched the body of Don Decker rise above the ground, just float several inches above the kitchen floor, levitating like he weighed nothing at all. It could have lasted a second or an hour, but it was over as soon as it started. Don's body was thrown across the room. He was thrown like he was nothing, like a corpse, and he hit the corner of the room with a terrible crack. It seemed at least that this incident brought Don back to himself. The pain of the fall cleared the fog of his mind, and he was horrified to realize that not only could he not make sense of anything that had happened since he first started to feel cold in the living room, and since he woke up in pain on the kitchen floor. But also, the source of the pain wasn't just his fall. The skin of his arms felt on fire. This was getting familiar. While the others watched, Don rolled up his sleeves of his shirt again, and this time he was more terrified than anyone else. There were brand new scratches all over his arms. Longer, deeper, much more viscous than the first ones. There was no shadow of a doubt that they were the presence of evil. It was unclear if this presence was hovering around Don, or if it was inside him, but it was certain that something demonic was attached to this poor young man. The group thought it was some kind of spirit controlling their guest. Don was convinced it was his grandfather, torturing him, even from beyond the grave. Either way, this was dangerous. Something catastrophic could happen. It was time to do something. Bob Kiefer, along with his wife, his landlord and his wife, moved Don Decker back to the living room, back to the despicable and unexplainable rain. Bob's wife had convinced herself that this was Don's fault and nothing could change her mind. At least they could agree the young man wasn't doing it on purpose. But there was something heinous adhered to him, and they couldn't take any more of it. They sat Don on a chair and the woman stood in front of him, holding a Bible in her hands, and determined to stay strong and be braver than she had ever been in her whole life. Then she started reading. She read Psalm 23, again and again. At first, her voice quivered. She hesitated when the rain got stronger. She felt a lump in her throat when Don started groaning in pain. But she kept going. The rain changed. It moved and stopped hitting the whole living room. It had found a new target. All the water concentrated on this vulnerable woman. But she was unstoppable. She spoke louder and louder, even as the force of the water coming at her from every direction made her shake on her feet, even as she trembled in cold in her drenched clothes. She stood her ground and prayed and prayed. The next morning, the rain was gone. Nobody could explain it, and no one knew quite what to do next, except for Don Decker who didn't have a choice.
he had to go back to prison to complete his sentence. His old friend felt somewhat guilty to feel relieved as he watched him walk away. Don would always be grateful for the kindness of accepting him into his home for the weekend when he needed it the most. But they would never see each other again. Back in prison, though, Don was uneasy. He could tell it wasn't over. He could feel this thing, this monstrous and dangerous thing still clued to his very soul, every second of every day. Life in prison was even harder than before. Rumours spread, and then everyone heard about his odd experience. His cellmate was new. The guards looked at him strangely, and Dave Keenhold, the experienced warden, could tell there was something off, something eerie about the atmosphere that surrounded Don Decker. Personally, Don Decker was starting to understand a few things. He was in pain, of course, and terrified at the feeling of a strange presence following him. But he started to suspect he could control this power, and he was ready to give it a try. He sat down on his bed while his cellmate worked at their desk. He concentrated, took deep breaths, closed his eyes tightly, and pulled his hands into hard fists. It was almost like meditation, but he wasn't focused on good feelings. He only thought about making it rain. And then it happened. It started slowly, enough to confuse his cellmate, but then it got worse and worse. Water started pouring from the ceiling. The other man jumped to his feet, but refused to face Don. Then the water started behaving strangely. Drops of water moved horizontally. Water ran up the walls to the ceiling. It was a personal storm, brought directly from hell. Don's cellmate lost his patience. He started screaming for help, banging desperately on the door more scared than ever before in his life. Don's experiment had succeeded. He had severely traumatized one more person. But this wouldn't come without consequences. The warden thought that he would solve it all by moving Don Decker to a cell by himself. But he didn't count on a couple of skeptical guards who, thinking it was all good fun, dared Don to prove his powers were real by making it rain in Dave Keenhold's office. Don said he would try, but he understood how difficult it would be. He wasn't a superhero, but he wasn't sure he was just himself anymore. Something or someone else was working within his body. He was just along for the ride. In one room, Don Decker sat on his bed focusing with everything he had on his memory of Dave Keenhold. In a completely different room, all the way across the prison, the warden focused on regular paperwork. Don strained his mind. Dave remained oblivious. The pressure increased with every passing second. Something powerful and intangible connected them. Danger was getting closer and closer. Don was on the edge of his seat, as tense as if he was fighting for his life. And then, with a snap of his fingers, it happened. Without warning, and without any possible explanation, Dave was startled out of his work by something hitting him right in the middle of his chest. He jumped off his chair, expecting a bullet, an assassination, an attack on the prison. But there was nothing nothing at all. When he looked down, all he saw was that his shirt was wet. It hadn't been a bullet. It was a drop of water. Exactly like the rumor said, it had to be the work of Don Decker. This had finally gone too far. What Don Decker had done was humanly impossible. Everyone around him was frightened and there was no doubt that he was possessed by something inhuman. The guards felt sick to their stomach when they were around him. 
in a building filled with criminals, the most terrifying thing around was Don Decker's eyes. Nobody knew what to do or how to fix it. So Dave Keenhold looked for outside help. He brought a priest into the prison. On the final day, the guards brought Don to a special room, and a few minutes later, the priest arrived and announced he was going to attempt an exorcism. The warden and the guards waited outside, hoping for the best and expecting the worst. Don acted just as he had done at Bob Kiefer's house, as if he wasn't there at all, as if he wasn't himself. But the priest was unfettered. He crossed himself, took Don's hand, and started reading from the Bible held in the other hand. The results were immediate. Both men shivered as the temperature dropped, and they grimaced when they smelled that scent. It was unfamiliar and the worst smell they had ever encountered. It was the scent of rotting flesh, and it sneaked into the room, getting stronger and stronger as the priest continued reading from the Bible. Next, the rain started, first falling from the ceiling, then hyper-focused on the priest. Then, coming at him from the floor and the walls, in every direction, defying every law of physics. And then, it got stronger and stronger. The water hit the man harder than it had ever done on any other occasion Don had seen it. But there was something different. The water couldn't touch the Bible. The priest was drenched in hellish water from head to toe, swaying with the ferocity of the attack. But the Bible was pristine and dry. Not a drop could land on it. Don couldn't take it anymore. He was no longer immune. As the damned rain, the rotten odour, and the holy screams of the priest grew in intensity, so did his pain. He started twisting and turning in his chair. He couldn't determine where the pain was coming from. He felt it in every atom of his being. He scratched his body. He begged for it all to end. He had visions of every horrible thing that had followed the death of his grandfather. The despicable face in the window, the terror in his friend's eyes, the blood, the water, the chaos. And then, it was all over. He fell limply to the floor and before he passed out, the last thing he heard was the priest banging on the door begging to be let out of that cursed room. For a long, long time, Don feared that this curse wasn't over. He got out of prison. He started a new life. And somewhere along the way, he left his fear behind. It really was over. He was free. He visited his grandfather's grave only once, 27 years later, just so he could look down at the cursed remains of that cruel man and tell himself, that it was all over. His grandfather hurt him his entire life and had tried to hurt him even after he had died. But that was all done. He wouldn't be able to hurt Don ever again. This episode was written by Danny Rahel Nieto and narrated by me, James Deverell. Thank you for watching or listening to this podcast episode on whichever platform you are choosing to do so. Whether it is YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, we truly appreciate your support. Now, what would a podcast episode or YouTube video be without a bit of sub-sobbing? So if you can find it in your heart to do so, please support my content by liking, subscribing, leaving comments and reviews wherever possible. It is super competitive out here, and YouTube especially has been suppressing my content like you wouldn't believe. Don't forget to join in the conversation on Twitter or X, and check out my other content on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Thanks again for listening.